matter to come before us this morning on the oral argument calendar is State of Ohio versus Michael Calhoun. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're the appellant and wish to reserve any type of rebuttal, please let me know when you get started so I can also keep track of that time. But it should be um, in front of you on the screen as well if I operate this machine correctly. Uh, please don't use the names of any victims or minors. Um, please refer to them as initials or victim one or however. It, it most uh, makes sense to you. We are recording this and it will be posted on the course YouTube channel. We have read the briefs and we're to see who you are. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Attorney Angie Kelly, on behalf of the appellant, Michael Calhoun, I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please. And the issues that I would like to touch on today in regards to the brief are, are more of questions of law as opposed to questions of fact. The first thing that I wanted to touch on is the sentencing of Mr. Calhoun, and it is our position that the sentencing of the trial court was, in fact, an abuse of discretion because it was not consistent with similar crimes by similar offenders. Um, in this situation, we have one individual who was actually shot, one individual who actually received harm, not minimizing the fact that there was permanent damage done to this woman. However, in review, and, and it's difficult to review other cases and re as it relates to sentencing issues, um, I am aware that this court reviewed the sentencing in State versus Shin, and that individual had one victim, felonious assault, paralyzed, um, which is a more severe injury. He was an adult, but a similarly light criminal history, and he received a 10-year sentence that this court affirmed. There's another State v. Smith, which is an 11-year sentence with a gun and serious injury. And in that case, the court went on and discussed that it is extremely difficult for appellate review in these types of situations. And I'm sure all of your honors are aware that there is a pilot program that has been, is being, going to be tested in the state of Ohio, which sounds quite brilliant to me. Because the reality is, is that when we're looking at whether or not your sentence is consistent with similar offenders in the same jurisdiction, there's such a limited amount of information that we can review in the case law that we can look up within that jurisdiction or another one, which basically makes it a moot situation for a lot of offenders. I mean, the simple truth is that if we had any type of information on who this victim is, who, how many victims there were, what the extent of the injury is, and all of the background of the individuals that are being sentenced, then we'd have more of an ability to ensure fairness throughout the system. And in bringing this up, not for the simple fact I recognize that the court cannot look to the future as to what is coming in regards to issuing a decision on this case, but I suppose our position would really be that this is a case where, in my opinion, if, he was in a, if we were in a different courtroom, we'd be looking at a later sentence. We're talking about one person, serious injury, young man of 17 years old with a nominal juvenile history who was bound over into the system and for his first offense was given a prison sentence that is longer than the number of years that he had been alive. That's concerning to me, um, especially when there's other people shooting each other and receiving half of that amount of time. And what is concerning is that even though there seems to be some movement, some push, that this is going to potentially be fixed and something that we can ensure a little bit more fairness, at least within our own courts, you know, not necessarily across the state, but even here in Summit County, if I'm across the hall, am I gonna get a lighter sentence? Is that that could take years. And in the meantime, we have this potential for these kind of discrepancies. So our position would be that when reviewing this, when a court is sentencing, I understand that they have to go through all the factors that are delineated in the sentence, but the practical application that has been being taken place through the courts is that they're just throwing the buzzwords from the statutes in their journal entry or out when they're saying something at sentencing, and they're not putting facts from that specific case in context as to how that relates to each individual one of those statutory factors for determining what the appropriate sentence is. So what we're asking the court is that that become a mandate, that you have to not just regurgitate the statutory language in order to say, I considered all of the relevant sentencing factors. I mean, in this case in particular, the judge, and I wrote 
I know in my brief I have the citation number, so I apologize, I don't remember the page offhand, but I mean, there was a request for a pre-sentence investigation so that we would have more of that information, particularly since this is a juvenile bind over, and she denied that request. She said, I heard the facts of this case. Well, the facts of the case are not enough information to adequately and appropriately review all of the factors that are required under the sentencing statute. So I'm asking this court to remand based on the fact that there is insufficient information in this record for appropriate appellate review. And on that, moving to the juvenile bind over, sort of the same position. I know this case was already previously in front of this court um, and reopened because the bind over information was not part of it. And in this situation, this was a discretionary bind over. So the court did have a probable cause hearing and the amenability hearing that this young man was entitled to by law. Reviewing those transcripts and reviewing the decision, once again, what I'm seeing is a lack of proper analysis in what the reasons are why this young man couldn't have been rehabilitated, re rehabilitated in the juvenile system. What we have is a couple of bullet points at the end of a journal entry, which is sort of a standard way that the court has at least always done it as far as I'm aware. But just because that's how it's been doesn't mean that it's right because it's not going through a full analysis of what all the applicable facts are in order for an appellate court to be able to review on an abuse of discretion. I mean, really, with the nominal information as to what the rationale is for those factors that we have in the journal entry in this case, what you all would have to do would be more of a um, de novo review. Review everything in there, and that's not what the standard is. It's an abuse of discretion, but without any facts being applied to the statutory language in the journal entry, then how are we supposed to do that? And the reality of the situation is, with a juvenile bind over, I think it's even more imperative, once again, that this is being done and analyzed properly. And the Ohio Supreme Court has twice indicated and reaffirmed that these are not final appealable orders until after final adjudication in the adult system because they have the same protections, they can get appropriate appellate review. And I'm gonna respectfully disagree because when we look at a situation like this, this young man has been in custody now for three and a half years. He's almost 22 years old. And even if we go back and say that this was not a proper bind over, it's not vacating a conviction that he can't, now he has to be charged as an adult. If he had the ability to be, to be charged as a juvenile when he was 17, because in theory he could still be under supervision until the age of 21, it's not a remedy anymore. So it may be that in this case that this isn't necessarily gonna change an outcome um, for Mr. Calhoun, but it could change the outcome for future youth to have a more detailed, in-depth, factually-based analysis under the statute in order for, once again, there to be a full, appropriate appellate review under the correct standard of review that the law requires. I don't have any questions. I would rest on my brief for the remainder. Seeing none, thank you. Okay. Please, the court, Kevin DiMartino, on behalf of the state of Ohio, the appellee, the IRS, and this court affirm Mr. Calhoun's convictions as well as his sentence. Uh, with regard to the um, assignment of error relating to the sentence that was imposed, there's no argument that the court failed to follow the procedures. The court indicated that it considered all the statutory factors for imposing the sentence and then imposed a sentence that is within the guidelines. Uh, the argument that the sentence is inconsistent based on um, cases cited in the appellant's brief, including Shin and Smith, those cases involved one victim and they were plea agreements. Uh, this case involved one victim who was shot in the esophagus and sustained um, life-threatening injuries, and then two other victims um, who had convictions for felonious assault based on um, attempting to cause physical harm under A2 with a deadly weapon. So this case is distinguishable from the cases uh, cited by the appellant for inconsistent sentences because they involved 
multiple victims, um, as well as the, the harm that was sustained by the victim in this case. As far as the amenability goes, uh, the court did analyze the factors that were in favor of transfer, as well as the factors that went against transfer. Uh, the court noted that it was following the factors in 21, 52, 12, DNA. The court found only two factors that were in favor of keeping the juvenile at juvenile court, but found multiple factors that weighed against the juvenile staying in the juvenile system. And those were noted, they include the fact that he used a firearm, the victim, one of the victims had a gunshot wound that required hospitalization, she sustained physical harm. The court talked about um, the fact that Mr. Calhoun has a lengthy record, including 17 adjudications, some for a serious um, physical harm to other people, as well as there were prior gun cases, as noted by Dr. Webb, including a CCW charge and having a weapon on a disability. Um, this individual had been ordered to a community-based correctional facility before where he participated in school, he had counseling, he had cognitive behavioral therapy. This offense occurred right after he finished probation. There were past rehabilitative efforts by Summit County Juvenile Court that were not effective. He was not rehabilitated. At the time of the hearing, I believe he was about a week from his 18th birthday, and at the time of the journal entry for amenability, he was about to turn 18 in just a few days. So the parties did stipulate to the amenability hearing from Dr. Webb, and he also testified, he talked about the fact that this individual had 17 prior delinquency adjudications, crimes against um, people, the CCW charge, the weapon under disability. Uh, Dr. Webb noted the juvenile court's prior rehabilitative efforts date back to when this individual was 12 years old, all the way back to 2014, and that the court had tried traditional probation, anger management, firearm safety, suspended DYS commitments, placement in residential and community correctional facility, as well as counseling. Um, basically, the, the doctor noted that there's really nothing left that DYS could offer this individual that he hasn't already been offered other than trade training. So the journal entry in this case does support um, the factors. There is a sufficient amount of analysis that's in the transcript and the journal entry to show that the trial court did not abuse its discretion in finding that this juvenile was not amenable to rehabilitative efforts at juvenile court. Uh, with regard to the case cited by Mr. Calhoun and Ray D.H., um, in that case, that delinquent uh, juvenile had only one open case, not 17 priors at Mr. Calhoun, and he had not been ordered into all of the different programming and uh, rehabilitative efforts that Mr. Calhoun had. So that case is distinguishable and is not dispositive, and we would ask that the court find that the trial court in this case did not abuse its discretion in finding that this juvenile was not amenable, amenable to juvenile court efforts. Um, I'll, I would rest my brief for there, unless there are any questions with regard to the other two defendants here. Seeing none, thank you, counsel. I would rest your honor. Thank you both very much for your presentations today. The court will take the matter under advisement and we'll issue a written decision, which will be mailed by the court of courts to all parties to this appeal on the day of this issue, as well as posted on the House Supreme Court website. Our